Hello, and welcome back to Introduction to Psychological Science. You've seen some remarkable things over the course of these lectures, and there are more remarkable things to come. But today's lecture is really special because I'm going to perform a miracle. This is true. If you stay till the end of the lecture, you will see me perform a miracle. But before I do, I want to dispel a miracle, and the topic of today's lecture, Neurons and Neural Computation, attempts to disp dispel the miracle that brain tissue can achieve the amazing feats that we have been discussing. I have said that recognizing faces, uh, understanding, remembering, planning, all consist of physiological activity in the neural tissues of the brain. That is the astonishing hypothesis. But I really haven't said how. I've just pointed to big regions of the brain as if they are made out of some kind of wonder tissue that can accomplish all of these amazing feats, like recognizing, uh, remembering, and planning. Today I'm going to try to uh, dispel that mystery by attempting to show how the this physical entity called the brain could possibly do things that we call intelligent. So the um, neural computation is a, an essential component in understanding the mind and brain in a biological context. It uh, explains the neurobiological level among the multiple levels in the cognitive biological multi-level approach, namely what brain tissue does, how it makes us smart. It's also the bridge to the computational or cognitive level, namely how are the elementary information processes uh, out of which computation is made storing and retrieving information, transforming one pattern to another, actually implemented in neural tissue. That's what we will explore. The hero of our story is depicted here. This is a real neuron or nerve cell grown in culture. <laughs> this is a schematic depiction from your textbook. A neuron is a cell of the body. As I have mentioned, a neuron is not the same thing as a nerve, which is a bundle of nerve fibers. Like any cell in the body, it has a, um, it has a, a soma or cell body with all of the apparatus that is needed to keep a cell alive. It's got a nucleus, it's got mitochondria, uh, and, and uh, all the rest. A neuron, in addition, has a number of extensions or processes called dendrites, from the Greek word for tree. These are where the neuron gets its inputs. A typical neuron has a single uh, long processor extension called an axon. That's the output fiber and the axons end in axon terminals that make contact with the dendrites of the next neuron in the network. Many neurons have along their axon a set of cell cells composed of a fatty substance called myelin called the collectively called the myelin sheath. That's what makes white matter white, and as we'll see, it speeds neural transmission along the axon. This is a uh, photograph that I have shown you before of a real neuron. The diagram you just saw was simplified in order to allow you to understand it, but a real one is far more complex. This one is in the hippocampus of the brain. The red and yellow fibers all belong to one neuron. The soma, or cell body, and the dendrites are shown in aura, orange. The, all of the axons and axon terminals are shown in yellow. This gives you an idea of the complexity that we're dealing with, one neuron. Now the nervous system is in the body, and it wouldn't be very useful if it didn't respond to things in the world and, and uh, get our bodies moving. The ultimate input to the nervous system comes from receptors. Receptors are a special kind of cell that transduce different kinds of energy into neural firings, uh, in, such as the rods and cones in the eye that transduce light into neural firings. The hair cells of the inner ear, we'll return to that next week, which translate, transduce vibrations in the air into neural fibers. The various receptors embedded in our skin that respond to pressure and heat and cold, and so on. The output. We are not just a brain in a vat, but our brains actually do things. They move our muscles, they control our glands. 
thanks to a different kind of structure called a neuromuscular junction. When a neural impulse reaches a neural neuromuscular junction through some chemistry that I won't describe today, it causes the muscle to twitch. And it's because of the neuromuscular junctions that neural firings can eventuate in actual behavior. The actual computation that allows us to recognize things that makes us smart takes place at the synapses, namely the connections between one neuron and another. This is shown in another diagram I've taken from your textbook. Here you've got some receptors in the skin. They uh, <coughs> connect to uh, a, a long dendrite. Here you've got a, uh, the soma or cell body. In the spinal cord, you have a synapse with a motor neuron. This one was called a sensory neuron. The motor neuron eventuates in neuromuscular junctions. So in this case, if you can imagine a very simple reflex, a um, pinch on the skin uh, is transmitted through a sensory neuron into the spinal cord and out through a motor neuron to the muscle making you flinch. Uh, although we often think of cells as these microscopic little um, uh, nanodots, the sensory and motor nerves in your body are macroscopic structures to go from your spinal cord to say your hand. It's not like you have cell, 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 cell. You have the motor neurons actually stretch the entire length of your arm. Likewise, the sensory neurons that bring sensations of touch into the nervous system. Now, neural transmission itself should not be thought of as the flow of fluids through pipes, even though neurons are, as we shall see, uh, pipe-like structures filled with fluid, but that's not what happens. They are also should not, should not be thought of as the transmission of electrical current along a conducting wire. Although the, there is electrical activity in the nervous system, it is very, very different from what happens in a uh, wire when you plug your headphones into a, uh, an I, uh, iPhone. For one thing, neural transmission is very, very slow compared to the speed of electricity. The speed of an impulse along one of your nerves is on the order of between 2 and 200 miles an hour, depending on the, uh, the neurons that we're talking about. The speed of electricity, close to the speed of light, is 670 million miles per hour. And mental processes unfold uh, <clears throat> over the course of tens of milliseconds, as we saw in the Posner letter matching experiment, whereas, of course, electronic processes in your iPhone or computer take place on the order of nanoseconds or billionths of a second. Also, an, another big difference in between electrical transmission and neural transmission is that with neural transmission, the energy is in the axon, it is not conducted by the axon. You can think of neurotransmission as more like the trail, uh, like lighting a trail of gunpowder where the energy is in there. Um, I had a professor who likened the operation of a neuron to a toilet. Once you flush it, it takes some time for it to refill before it can be flushed again. This diagram from your textbook shows what we are dealing with. It is a, a zoomed in view of the uh, membrane of a neuron. And a way I like to think about how a neuron works is, imagine that a neuron is a bag of low sodium chicken soup sitting in uh, a bath of salt water. So this is the, <clears throat> the bath of salt water. This is the extracellular fluid in which the neuron is situated. And it's got a lot of dissolved salt, and salt is NaCl. That means when it's dissolved, there are sodium or Na ions that are positively charged, chloride or Cl ions, which are negatively charged. In, uh, this is the interior of the neuron, and here we've got a lot of protein molecules. That's what I think of as the, uh, the, the chicken and the chicken soup. And uh, potassium positively charged ions, uh, you're using potassium chloride uh, because this is a, uh, a low, low sodium salt. Now, if you compare the charges on the inside of the neuron and the outside of the neuron, separated by this uh, membrane, it is overall negatively charged because you've got these big fat protein molecules, uh, each of which has a uh, big negative charge. Separating them, the membrane, or the, the, the baggie, 
is studded with these little holes that should not really be thought of as pores, just as, just as holes, but as little contraptions, little trap doors, and they're specific to a particular kind of ion. This is a potassium channel, it allows potassium to go out. This is a sodium uh, channel, it allows sodium ions to go, to, uh, go in. Just to show you what it looks like in real life, so we're not totally in the realm of uh, schematic diagrams. This is a real ion channel, a rather complex molecular contraption. Now imagine, I'm not going to explain why just yet, but just imagine that the trap door in a sodium channel is open and sodium ions uh, start to uh, pour into this, the cell. Well, in this little patch of cell membrane, you're going to have the charge that is, will now change with all of this influx of sodium that formerly had been kept out by these little trapdoors. I'm going to be showing you now two diagrams. They come from your textbook, but they're easy to confuse. And so I'm going to explain the difference with a very couple of concrete images. Imagine we have a voltmeter. It can uh, register a uh, charge, a difference in positive and negative charges across the membrane. We're going to impale the membrane with an electrode and measure the potential across the membrane, almost like it's a, a battery. We are only going to do this in one part of that uh, membrane, of the neuron, neuronal membrane, but we are going to plot how it changes over time, which is why I have shown you a stopwatch. So here's what happens as the sodium uh, pours in. This is the resting potential. It's minus 70 millivolts. This is what happens before our story begins when the neuron is just sitting around minding its business. When the sodium channels open, I haven't told you yet why they open, just imagine that they do, sodium pours in and as all of those positive ions start to fill up the interior of the cell in that patch of membrane, the charge goes from slightly negative to positive. Now, when the polarity of the charge across the membrane changes, that then opens up the potassium channels, which allow potassium to exit the cell. Potassium ions are also positively charged, and that brings the polarization back to negative. After the sodium comes in, the potassium goes out, they cancel each other out, and you go back to the resting potential. That happens. The, um, so the ion channels are sensitive to changes in the voltage in the neighboring patch of membrane. Now, I said that I, I, it was just a bit of magic why sodium channels open when they do. Now I'm going to <coughs> dispel that bit of magic. The one reason that a sodium channel can open and let sodium ions in is if that neighborhood of the membrane becomes depolarized. That is when it flips from minus to plus, that also opens that sodium channel, which then in turn opens the potassium channel. The net result is that when a one portion of the membrane depolarizes, flips its electrical charge, that opens the channels on a neighboring patch of membrane and the process can repeat, allowing that depolarization to move along the length of the membrane. This is a diagram not from your textbook, from a much simpler textbook. It doesn't even credit students with knowing what an ion is. These are uh, positive atoms. Nonetheless, it's a helpful diagram. Positive atoms, uh, that is ions, move in. These are sodium. Then positive atoms, i.e. potassium, move out. That opens the sodium channels in the neighboring patch of membrane. Sodium comes in. Potassium goes out. That triggers the process in a neighboring patch of me membrane and so on. Over here, I have depicted a whole row of voltmeters because now instead of showing how voltage changes over time in one patch of the membrane, I'm going to show you a diagram that shows how at a frozen snapshot in time, it varies along the length of the axon. So this again is from your textbook. You've got a depolarization in this patch of the membrane with sodium ions pouring in. You've got a repolarization in the neighboring patch, potassium ions pouring out. A, a little bit down, you've got the same thing. If I were now to take this freeze frame 
and then turn on the movie, what you would see is these uh, spikes, these depolarizations, traveling along the length of the membrane. That is a neural impulse, and the depolarization and repolarization is sometimes called a spike. That's what it looks like if you compress the time axis on a diagram like this. Uh, okay, the, uh, an extra bit of information is that these sausages, these uh, oligodendrocytes, these cells filled with uh, fatty myelin, making white matter white, um, have little gaps in between them. The, in reality, when you have a myelinated axon, the n nervous impulse, instead of having to creep its way all the way down the length of the axon, it jumps from gap to gap. That speeds up the neural transmission. Well, things change when you get to the end of the axon, at the, the axon terminals, and it makes contact with the dendrites of the next neuron down. The, this junction is called a synapse. This is a, an artist's depiction of a synapse. Here is a, um, a, a real photograph uh, of them, where these bulges are the axon terminals, also called uh, boutons, buttons. The uh, axon terminals make contact with little uh, extensions from the dendrites, called dendritic spines. You can see them in this actual photograph. And this, from your textbook, shows you, first of all, the synapse uh, from a distance. This is the axon of one neuron. This, these are the dendrites of the next neuron down. It's blown up over here. This is the axon terminal. Now the axon terminal whoops, uh, uh, is filled with little baggies of chemicals called synaptic vesicles that are floating around in this bulbous terminal. Again, I'm going to, I like showing real pictures, not just artist depiction. So this is a, a, a real synaptic vesicle. The textbook then blows up the, uh, after blowing up the synapse from the neuron to neuron diagram, it zooms in on the actual membrane at the end of the uh, axon terminal. And what you have is uh, rather than the axon terminal actually contacting the dendritic spine of the next neuron, there's actually a little gap between them, the synaptic cleft. And I'm going to zoom in yet again. Here again, what, just to orient you, this is the interior of the synaptic terminal filled with synaptic vesicles. This is called the presynaptic membrane, synaptic cleft, postsynaptic membrane. The when through some molecular magic, which I'm not going to explain, when a neural impulse reaches the end of an axon terminal, it causes the synaptic vesicles to fuse with the presynaptic membrane. That It opens them up, they kind of barf their content of neurotransmitter molecules into the synaptic cleft. The molecules diffuse across the cleft. They make contact with another kind of channel in the postsynaptic membrane. And the mechanics, the molecular mechanics of those channels work that when a neurotransmitter molecule fits into this little um, receptor, it opens up a uh, gate and it allows sodium ions to flow into the postsynaptic neuron, starting the whole process of neural uh, impulse transmission in the postsynaptic neuron. That is how you, how one neuron passes a uh, activation or a signal onto the next one. Very different from a wire being soldered onto uh, another wire or onto a battery terminal or just making contact with a battery terminal. That's not the way the nervous system works. Now the fact that the transmission shifts from electrical as it goes down the length of the axon to chemical as it jumps across the cleft from one neuron to another changes everything because now we have an entree for chemistry to affect brain function, which in turn means drugs are possible. Drugs that affect mood and perception and alertness and so on. And basically all of the drugs that you might take, whether uh, therapeutically or recreationally, have their action by affecting the release of neurotransmitters. Neurotrans 
by allowing more of them to diffuse across the synaptic membrane, preventing them from being recycled, so there's more available, interfering with their ability to fit into the receptors and uh, other mechanisms of operation. You've probably heard of many of them, the textbook goes over them. There's norepinephrine, also called noradrenaline, chemically related to the adrenaline released by your adrenal glands, involved in alertness and arousal and stress. Uh, acetylcholine, which it works at the neuromuscular junction, drugs like curare that paralyze you, prevent acetylcholine from uh, fitting into their receptors. Dopamine, involved in reward and attention, and affected by drugs like cocaine, amphetamines, and drugs for ADHD. Serotonin, involved in pleasure and calm, and affected by mood-altering drugs like antidepressants. Uh, Glutamate is a, an amino acid that is one of the main neurotransmitters in the cerebral cortex, and uh, especially the excitatory synapses, and GABA is a neurotransmitter that is involved in the inhibitory synapses, uh, which uh, are affected by drugs for insomnia. When you take Ambien and uh, other hypnotic drugs, it increases the amount of GABA, more inhibition, uh, you fall asleep. Now, inhibition is a crucial part of our story. If all you had were neurons exciting other neurons, which excite other neurons, which, which excite still other neurons, your whole brain would just uh, kind of blow up in this um, cacophony of firing. So you also need uh, connections that ramp down the, the level of firing, and which, as we will see, make neural computation possible. Inhibitory synapses work similarly to the excitatory ones that I've just described, except they, the synapses tend to be directly on the soma, the cell body, rather than at the dendrites. And there, when a neurotransmitter is dumped into the synaptic cleft and then uh, contacts receptors in the postsynaptic membrane, instead of allowing the postsynaptic neuron to fire more, it uh, prevents it from firing, and so it ramps down the rate of transmission of neural impulses. Okay, that's a very quick overview of how neurons work. The question now is, how can this explain how we can do anything intelligent? That neurons, as opposed to just firing, allow us to see and move and think and remember and so on. This uh, is the subject matter of, the, of neural computation, and it all begins with feature detectors. These are neural circuits that allow the brain to respond not just to little pinpoints of light or little bursts of sound, but to patterns in the world that we might think of as carrying some kind of, of meaning. The uh, simplest feature detector was discovered almost by accident in an epical discovery by David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel, neuroscientists who worked at Harvard Medical School, who won a Nobel Prize for the discovery that they are about to narrate in this video, that they made almost by accident. It's an old video, and, uh, but it still amazes me every time I, I see it. We started working, Torsten and I, in the late 50s. We set up our first experiments, and they didn't go well because at the beginning we couldn't make the cells fire at all. We'd shine lights all over the screen and nothing seemed to work. And rather by accident, one day, we were shining small spots, either white spots or black spots, onto the screen. And we found that the black dot seemed to be working in a way that at first we couldn't understand until we found it. It was the process of slipping the piece of glass into the projector, which swept a line, a very faint, precise, narrow line across the retina. And every time we did that, we'd get a response. And even more than that, the line produced a response as it swept across the screen in one direction, but not in the reverse direction. Of course, that could have simply been a, a, an oddball cell. We didn't know whether we'd ever find another such cell, but after some weeks or months, it became pretty clear that most of the cells that we encountered in the visual cortex demanded just that kind of stimulus. 
although from one cell to the next the orientation varied. A number of other things differed. The line was the important thing. Okay, so th those are the cells that they were recording from came from, not from the eye, but from the brain, from the primary visual cortex. And they hypothesized that they were the result of a circuit that translated from mere pinpoints of light, nothing particular, particularly intelligent there, to the first thing that we might be willing to call a pattern in the brain, namely a line. So they imagined, uh, here this is a little patch of the cat's retina, imagine that these are all rods and cones. Uh, the, imagine that a bunch of cones that are uh, arranged in a line like this happen to be wired together so that they all fed a neuron in the visual cortex in the back of the brain, so that this cell, they called it a simple cell, would not respond to a patch of light, but would respond only to a pattern that uh, fell into a line. This would be the brain getting something that is, uh, goes above and beyond mere stimulation, but that actually represents pattern. Well, it's a start. How do we then get to more complex concepts? This is where we have to investigate the prop property of neural networks in a little bit more detail than uh, Hubel and Wiesel's simple cells. This is a, uh, a simple diagram of a uh, patch of cortex giving you a, uh, a hint of about 10% of the neurons in a cortical column. Here is a totally schematic diagram from your textbook showing a neural network. Even there you can see there are an awful lot of uh, combinatorial possibilities in the possible firings of different subsets of neurons. Let's take a look at how they work. Again, I, I like to show real pictures. This is a real neural network with the Brainbow uh, uh, imaging technology developed here at Harvard that allows different neurons to absorb different color dyes, uh, allowing the, them to stand out from one another. Okay, one of the first things we have to do in order to get any kind of intelligent system is get it to handle elementary logical operations like AND, OR, and NOT. For example, a concept that is slightly more complex than a line would be the concept of kosher from the Jewish dietary laws and a way of understanding the concept of kosher is that it refers to anything that chews its cud and has cloven hooves or has fins and has scales. So uh, chews its cud and has cloven hooves distinguishes uh, beef from pork because Cattle chew their cud, pigs don't, in the, but it isn't just beef that is kosher, you can also eat fish, as long as the fish has fins and scales, so this rules out lobsters and uh, scallops and, and so on, but either of these are, are kosher. So and, or, and not are the way that simple concepts get combined into complex concepts in any intelligent system. How does that work? Well, a, a, Epical discovery about neurons is that they have what it takes to compute logical functions, and, or, and not. So you can go from tissue, from cells, to logic, combinations of concepts. So here's the basic idea behind neural co uh, computation. This is a very simple neural network. Here are a bunch of input neurons. Here is an output neuron. The excitatory synapses are shown with arrows, the inhibitory synapses are shown uh, with, this, uh, with these dots. The sy synapses can have different strengths which indicate the probability that the postsynaptic neuron will fire given the a certain amount of input presynaptically, and we can write the strength of the synapses uh, as little numbers next to the axons. They won't all fit in this little um, corona over here. Okay. The, way, the simplest way you can imagine neural computation working is that the, uh, at the output neuron, it, what it does is it multiplies the firing rate of each of the incoming neurons by the weight or strength of the synapse. It sums those weighted uh, signals. If it exceeds a threshold of the cell, a minimum amount of input that it needs before it fires in turn, 
then it will fire, otherwise it will re remain at its prior low resting rate. Well, with those simple properties, we can build the elementary units of any computational system, namely logic gates. Here we have a three neuron network that can compute AND. What does AND mean? Well, the meaning of P and Q uh, is, that it is that P and Q is true if uh, P is Q and Q is true. They both have to be true. So imagine th this is our P and Q neuron. Imagine this is our P neuron. Imagine this is our Q neuron. These are the synaptic weights, 0.4 and 0.4. Uh, the threshold of the output neuron is 0.5. So if P is on and Q is not, it will, let's say that its firing rate, we'll call it 1. 1 times 0.4 is 0.4, less than 0.5, not enough to excite the output neuron, so P alone won't do it. By the same logic, Q alone won't do it. But if P is firing and Q is firing, well, 1 times 0.4 plus 1 times 0.4 is 0.4 plus 0.4 is uh, 0.8. That exceeds 0.5, and so this neuron will fire when and only when both of its inputs are firing. What does OR mean? P or Q is true if P is Q or if Q is true. That can be implemented in a neural network with slightly different synaptic weights. Call this the P neuron, call this the Q neuron. This is the P or Q neuron. It has a threshold of 0.5. If P is on, uh, then the firing rate, let's call it 1. 1 times 0.6 is, exceeds 0.5. That's enough to turn on the output, or P or Q neuron. Same is true of the Q neuron. Uh, it alone, if firing, is, will suffice to turn on the output neuron. So this network will compute P or Q. Finally, imagine a neuron with a threshold of 0, which means to say it fires even when it gets no input. Just, that's just what it does. It fires with a single inhibitory synapse. Uh, we'll call it the not P neuron. We'll call this the P neuron. When P fires, 1 times minus uh, 0.1 is minus 0.1. That drags it below the threshold, stops it from firing. Conversely, when this is not firing, when we have not P, uh, when, sorry, when P is false, then uh, <clears throat> nothing will prevent the output neuron from firing. It will fire when its input is uh, not firing. That is false. So not P is true when P is false and vice versa. Well, I've used kosher as my example because with rabbinical precision, it can be defined with some ands and ors and nots uh, based on elementary properties of the kind that we could imagine feature detectors detecting. But of course, most human concepts are not like kosher. They tend to be kind of harder to find. They're, they're kind of fuzzy, like vegetable, for example. Unlike kosher, there is no hard and fast logical definition of a vegetable. Vegetables include, uh, uh, they include uh, roots like carrots and fruits like um, squash and leaves like lettuce and stems like uh, celery. Some vegetables are green, but some of them are orange, and some of them are crunchy, and some of them are soft. And others, like fiddleheads, aren't even flowering plants, but they're ferns, and mushrooms are, are uh, fungi. Uh, there's just no way that you could have a bunch of ands, ors, and nots that will give you a vegetable. But that's okay, because you can devise a neural network, sometimes called a pattern associator, that can aggregate fuzzy statistical information. Imagine that these are a bunch of feature detectors for prop various properties of foods, green, leafy, uh, crisp, sweet, red, and so on. Here are a bunch of output neurons for different categories of food, vegetable, fruit, dessert, meat, and so on. I've indicated this time the strength of the synapses. There's too messy to put in numbers just by the thickness of the lines. Well, you can imagine a vegetable detector that was more, slightly more likely to fire when there are somewhat more veggie-like features in the food. So the, 
green. Greenness is likely to up it and leafiness not quite as much, crispness somewhat. somewhat. Others will have strong inhibitory links like animal or uh, doughy. The difference between spaghetti squash and spaghetti, one of them is a vegetable, the other one isn't, is whether it's uh, actually doughy. You can imagine then a statistical aggregator that would kind of add up the evidence, positive and negative, and be more likely to fire if uh, more contributing features were present. Now you might even object to that and say, well, yeah, but you know, more of this and less of that, could that ever pick out a uh, vegetable in a way that would distinguish say tomatoes and beets on the one hand from apples on the other, but still roping in the mushrooms and the fiddleheads and the potatoes. Well, you might say you need some kind of intermediate representation that would stand for different subcategories of vegetable, maybe one of them for tubers like uh, potatoes and turnips, another one for um, cucurbits or fruits like cucumbers and squash, still another one for uh, things like um, tomatoes. And you could do that by having an intermediate level called a hidden layer, and a three-layer network can be called a pattern, a hidden layer pattern associator. And you could even think of it unlike a kind of stimulus to response mapping. You remember the Gary Larson cartoon of the amoeba? one saying to the other, stimulus, response, stimulus, response, don't you ever think. The hidden layer is a kind of internal representation. And I have a reason for showing you a hidden layer pattern associator. We will return to it shortly because that has implications for artificial intelligence. Okay, well, could you actually have uh, neurons that can respond to very complex patterns, in this case vegetables, as a result of lots and lots of input features combining uh, uh, to excite or inhibit different intermediate representations. I will now uh, show you one of the first demonstrations of a neuron in the higher levels of the brain, in this case the uh, what portion of the visual system, which we saw in a, 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 the previous lecture. That was the part that when damaged leads to prosopagnosia. Again, I, in that lecture I talked about big patches of brain as if they could compute functions by magic. Now I'm going to show you a single neuron that can respond to a face, in this case in a, uh, in a monkey. They can record from single neurons in part of the inferior temporal lobe and these neurons will be activated by faces better than by any other kind of stimulus that they can present. Not only will they be activated by faces, but if the faces are distorted in certain ways, the neurons will not respond. As we watch, we can hear single cells in the inferior temporal lobe of monkeys reacting to a single monkey face. The cell only fires if the face is at the right angle and is not distorted. The crackling and popping that you uh, were hearing was literally the amplified sound of neural spikes, the firing of these cells, showing that individual neurons can respond to the output of complicated cascades that represent patterns, such as an intact monkey's face, even distinguishing it from a, uh, a split monkey's face. The, uh, in showing you a single neuron that responded to a monkey's face, I don't want to make it seem as if for every concept in the brain there is one neuron. This is a possibility that has long been debated within neuroscience. Uh, there, these are called local representations. A, a satirical term for them was the grandmother cell, the hypothetical neuron in your brain that would respond only when you saw your grandmother's face sometimes also called Volkswagen detectors or yellow Volkswagen detectors. And many neurobiologists were skeptical that the brain really has grandmother detectors. Uh, the contrast would be a distributed representation 
where a concept, instead of being represented by one neuron, there would be a whole suite of neurons and the patterns of activity, almost more like chords as opposed to single keys on the piano, would represent a concept. As it happens, we actually do have grandmother cells. Uh, I, I don't know if anyone's actually discovered the grandmother cell, but a number of years ago, a neurophysiologist discovered a Jennifer Aniston cell. This is true. In a patient whose brain was being probed during neurosurgery, they found neurons that would respond to faces as specific as the actress uh, Jennifer Aniston. The reality is that there is a combination of neurons of varying degrees of specificity. Generally, most concepts don't have their single uh, grandmother cell or Volkswagen detector. For one thing, we just have too many concepts for every one of them to have uh, its own neuron. You would, you would quickly run out of brain. And of course, it isn't as if your neurons are dying all the time. If you had a neuron that died, you'd suddenly be unable to recognize Jennifer Aniston. Uh, even with redundant representations, that's unlikely the way it works. Uh, in, in general, many concepts have some mixture of more and less specific neurons that fire at the same time to represent that concept. Okay, well, uh, all the intelligence in these neural networks really consists in the pattern of synaptic weights and in the thresholds of the neurons. And you might ask, well, how did they get there? Now, based on the lecture on nature and nurture, there is reason to think that there is some tuning at birth or through maturation in our neural networks. But obviously, we are not born with innate knowledge of what Jennifer Aniston looks like. We have to learn. and the uh, principal theory of how learning works in the brain. That is, what happens in your brain between not knowing something and knowing something? It's got to be in there somewhere. There's got to be some change. So that, that consists of changes in the synaptic weights in your neural networks and perhaps in your thresholds. And that gets us into the topic of learning in neural networks. If, we, if you conceive of neural computation, as neurons that aggregate signals coming in from many synapses and changing their firing rates, then neural learning would consist of neurons that are sensitive to patterns in their input signals uh, and, uh, and their firing rates and changing the strength of uh, synapse in response. That's what learning, uh, uh, what, um, learning would consist of in neural networks. One kind of learning mechanism in neural networks is explained in your textbook called Hebbian learning after the psychologist D.O. Hebb, who, whom we have met a couple of times in the course before. And the way Hebbian learning works can be summarized in a bit of doggerel. Neurons that fire together, wire together. Neurons that are out of sync fail to link. From your textbook, imagine that you have a postsynaptic neuron that in its, say, newborn state fires in response to inputs from B, but not in response to A. Uh, but in a sense, it should fire in response to A and B. Well, if uh, A fires and uh, C also fires thanks to its input from B, and they fire at the same time, the mechanism of Hebbian learning would strengthen that synapse. The combination of transmitter molecules coming from A and the fact that C is firing independently. A, to begin with, did not have enough oomph to fire C, but uh, it was firing thanks to B. But with these two firing at the same time, it's as if the brain takes that as a signal that, they, that A ought to be exciting B, and so this synapse gets strengthened. Now, uh, this brings us to the uh, entire field of algorithms for changing synaptic weights in neural networks. And many of you who have noticed the explosion of uh, computing power in artificial intelligence in the last five years have perhaps heard of deep learning networks. Deep learning involves uh, 
hidden layer networks, not just with one hidden layer, but with 10, 15, sometimes hundreds, and with not just a handful of neurons, but millions or billions uh, of neurons. The way deep learning works, it's not clear if the brain does anything like this, but it's just a way of showing how the mechanism that changes neural uh, uh, synaptic strengths and thresholds is where intelligence uh, lives. In a very brief, very small nutshell, here's how deep learning works. You have a supervisor, a little bit of magic, but the correct answer, the set of firings that the network ought to have in response to a particular pattern of input is provided by a kind of teacher or supervisor. The network compares the correct outputs from the supervisor in the data set with its actual output that to begin with is kind of feeble or random. It compares, looks at the discrepancy and it adjusts the synaptic weights and the thresholds so that the next time it gets that pattern of input, it's more likely to produce the desired input. Then it uh, propagates that discrepancy backward and adjusts the synaptic weights and thresholds one layer back, and it keeps doing it for as many layers as there are in the network. They're called deep learning, not because what they learn is particularly deep, actually they kind of, they don't really understand anything, but just that there are layers upon layers upon layers upon layers. Okay, so what does all of this have to do with our psychology? How can we use what we have just learned about neurons and neural networks to explain mental life? That's what the last part of the lecture will be. I'm going to give you three features of wiring in real neural networks. Forget the, the, the AI, forget the deep learning, forget the uh, simplified diagrams in your textbooks. But things that we know from neurophysiology are true of actual neural networks in uh, brains that can explain our uh, subjective experience of particular perceptual patterns. And just to, to preview, I'm going to, they are called lateral inhibition, opponent process circuitry, and habituation. Let me go over each one in turn. Okay, lateral inhibition is a kind of wiring that is found throughout the animal kingdom in neural systems, and it consists of the following wiring diagram. You have an input and it excites an output. It's the neighboring inputs inhibit that very same output. So imagine that you are sitting in between two other people in, in a class and I uh, point my laser pointer at your chest. Whenever that happens, you do two things. You stand up and you push your neighbors down and they do the same thing. Okay, that's lateral inhibition and you see it uh, all over the animal kingdom. Here's a real lateral inhibition network or partly schematic from your textbook. This is from the retina. This is a patch of retina here. Imagine, uh, and it's similar to what we saw in Hubel and Wiesel's circuit diagram for simple cells, but imagine a patch of retina that has a bunch of receptors, we'll call them cones, and they all excite a bipolar cell, that's the, in the intermediate layer of the retina, which then excites a ganglion cell, which carries the signal to the visual cortex of the brain. But at the same time, we've got a kind of bagel-shaped ring around the uh, center area, also studded with, with uh, cones, but these are connected to the bipolar and ultimately to the ganglion cell by an inhibitory synapse. So when these cones are activated, they excite the ganglion cell. When these cones are activated, they inhibit the same ganglion cell. Now think about it uh, a little bit. What would be, if you wanted to get this ganglion cell to fire at the maximum rate, how would you stimulate this patch of retina? Well, if you shined a flashlight on it, so this entire area got illuminated, it wouldn't do a whole lot because on the one hand, the light falling on the center 
would excite that ganglion cell, but the light falling on the surround would inhibit the ganglion cell, and it would not exactly be a wash, but it wouldn't fire a whole lot. If you really wanted to send this guy, uh, have him screaming his head off, you would have a spot of light that fell exactly into the center and darkness in the surround, so it would get the maximal excitation, but would not get any inhibition. Uh, imagine now our very simplified circuit, simply replicated across the visual field. Uh, this, of course, is just one stripe across the, uh, the uh, retina. But now consider what it would do in the aggregate for a particular pattern of stimulation. Consider in particular a spot of light across the, um, the occupied a portion of this strip of retina. We'll plot the brightness as a function of space, so dark, 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 bright, 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 dark, 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 dark. That's the input, that's the stimulus. We now feed this through the network, remembering that any portion that is stimulated while its neighbors are stimulated is going to have a kind of wimpy output. But if you have a part that it's stimulated where its neighbor is not, it will be excited it won't be inhibited by its neighbor, so it will fire at a uh, super high rate. This is what the output firing pattern across this network would be, given that it is stimulated by this uh, input pattern. You have kind of a, uh, a Batman shape, where the parts in the middle of the spot, which are both excited by their direct inputs and inhibited by their neighbors, net excitation is not that much. The part at the edge gets excited by its input, but it is not inhibited by its neighbor, so it fires uh, more than average. The part of the background, which is not only uh, dark, but is inhibited by its bright neighbor, will actually fire below the resting rate, and it should be darker than average. So this is a plot of what it should look like. And um, let me show you what, what this does look like. Lateral inhibition is not just a feature of neural networks that we detect with little microelectrodes, but it predicts how you actually see. Three perceptual phenomena known for some time. Mach bands, herring grid, simultaneous contrast. They mean nothing yet. Give me, uh, give me a chance. This from your textbook is a bunch of stripes going from black to white. But if you look at them carefully, you might notice something you've never even noticed before, that uh, they don't, obviously they, they're, each one is a uniform gray. But when you look at it, you probably should see that this edge here looks a little bit brighter than the rest of it. Likewise, in the next stripe over, the portion next to the lighter stripe is a little bit darker here and a little bit brighter here. Again, over here, a little bit darker at the right end, a little bit lighter at the left end, and so on for each stripe. The perceptual appearance is plotted by this sawtooth. The actual physical input is uh, corresponding to this staircase. The, these lighter parts are called Mach bands, named after the great physicist Ernst Mach, and it's a feature of your consciousness that can be explained by neural wiring that we, that we know of, that has actually been documented as the way nervous systems are wired up. Uh, the explanation, and this comes from your textbook, um, I've uh, already mentioned it, so I'll go through it very quickly, but for uh, a patch A in the middle of a stripe, it is being excited, but it's also being inhibited, whereas Area B, it is being excited by the inputs coming in from B, but it is not being inhibited by the, um, its neighbors in the dark stripe adjacent. Therefore, the, you get a mock band over here where this portion of the stripe gets the uh, same amount of excitation as the rest of the stripe, but much, much less inhibition. Vice versa, when you compare a point in the middle of a darker stripe with a point near the edge. It can also explain a phenomenon called the herring grid, named after a psychologist named Herring. It has nothing to do with the fish. But in this checkerboard, you probably see some ghostly gray squares at the intersections. 
You should, by the way, see them everywhere but the intersection you're actually looking at. So as your eye darts around the diagram, you should see ghostly gray squares everywhere but where you're looking. In the discussion section, I'm going to ask you to explain why that should be true. Here is an explanation of why the gray square should exist at all in terms of lateral inhibition. In a, the middle of a city block, you have a lot of excitation from uh, that, uh, the input from that spot, and you've got very little inhibition because the entire edge above and the entire edge below are much darker. They're darker, less input. Less input means less lateral inhibition, less inhibition coming from your neighbors. Whereas at the intersection, you are, uh, the output is not only being stimulated by the inputs coming from that spot, but it's being inhibited here, it's being inhibited here, it's being inhibited here, it's being inhibited here. It's got twice the amount of inhibition as the part in the middle of the city block has. Therefore, there is less uh, net output, which we perceive as a darker, hence, gray spot. Once again, your consciousness predicted by neural wiring. This is an even better example. I got this in an email a few years ago where, uh, again, you can, you can work out why the uh, ghostly black squares are so vivid and compelling. And again, they dart around depending on where, where you're looking, but uh, lateral inhibition is a, a, the explanation for these uh, non-existent black spots that you're seeing. Lateral inhibition could also explain simultaneous contrast. I believe this is from your textbook. These spots are all the same shade of gray, but you should see this one as much brighter than that one. That's because they, even though they are all being stimulated by the same amount of input, uh, the gray square in the middle of a, sorry, the gray circle in the middle of a black square is getting um, no inhibition, so all of its activation is jacking up the uh, output neurons, whereas the same amount of input when surrounded by a light surround from this white square is not only getting excited by the input from the spot, but is also getting inhibited, therefore looks darker. Even better example is, um, is this one over here, where, believe it or not, the, this rectangle is a uniform gray, but you can actually see continuously the change in perceptual lightness. When it's surrounded by a black field, it looks quite bright. When it's surrounded by a bright field, it looks quite dark. Here I simply masked off the surround and it goes to a uniform gray. Put the surround back and bang! the mock bands, uh, the simultaneous contrast, however you want to call them, reappear. Okay, why lateral inhibition? Why do we see this feature of neural wiring in so many organisms? It does have an explanation, namely it's a general feature of your nervous system that it doesn't care about what is constant across the visual field or what's constant over time. It cares about changes. It cares about differences. If things are uniform, that's kind of boring. What it cares about is where things change. In particular, what lateral inhibition does is it indicates changes across the visual field which correspond to edges and boundaries. So this photograph of a rose, when fed through a lateral inhibition network, would be rendered something like this figure over here. I created it in Photoshop, where all of the uniform areas are kind of suppressed, but we get a nice crisp delineation of where the rose ends and where the background uh, begins. This is also the trick, by the way, that uh, Netflix and Amazon and, and uh, other uh, video services use to compress the video stream that they feed into your TV. Instead of saying this pixel is pink and this pixel is pink and pink and this pixel is pink and so on, it just says there's an edge here, then a whole bunch of pinkness, then another edge, and that takes up a lot less bandwidth. Okay, lateral inhibition is one feature of neural wiring that can explain some of our subjective experience. Another one is a also ubiquitous feature of neural wiring called the opponent process circuit. So now stop thinking about distribution of neurons and receptors in space. Uh, think about 
receptors that respond to different qualities. And here's the way a lot of your nervous system is wired. You have two inputs to a cell that come from qualitatively opposite kinds of inputs. So you might have a hot receptor and a cold receptor converging on a neuron in the skin. You might have a receptor from a red cone and a green cone converging on a intermediate layer in your retina. In your motion sensitive areas of the brain, which I talked about in the last lecture, you might have neurons that respond to inward motion and neurons that respond to outward motion converging on the next cell down. The way that, though, that those output neurons correspond to experience is that uh, rather than two different kinds of uh, uh, stimuli standing for different kinds of experience, a single neuron registers a particular kind of experience such that when it fires above a certain level, you see red. When it fires below a certain level, you see green. Or when it fires above a certain level, you, it feels warm. Below a certain level, it feels cold. Above a certain level, things uh, move out from the center. Below a certain level, they converge in towards the center. So the level of activity of the output, whether it's excited or inhibited relative to a baseline, determines the perceived quality. Again, from your textbook, an example of opponent process circuitry in the retina. Here you've got a green cone, here you've got a red cone, here you've got a ganglion cell that goes to the visual cortex of the brain. The wiring is such that the uh, red cone excites this opponent process cell. The green cone via an inhibitory neuron inhibits it. So this is neither a red detector nor a green detector. It's a relative redness versus greenness detector. Now, I'm going to ask you to take a bit of a mental leap. Forgive me. I want you to combine the concept that I have just explained, namely opponent process circuitry, with the feature that I explained just before that, namely lateral inhibition. When you combine them, you get a phenomenon called simultaneous color contrast. This is similar to the simultaneous lightness contrast that I just showed you with that, that uh, long gray rectangle or the spot, the identical gray spots in different contrast surrounds. But now, instead of the circuitry making something seem a little lighter, a little darker, now it's going to change the qualitative appearance of what you see. Uh, here's the example. Now, uh, here we've got a pale yellow X, here we've got a mauve X, but in reality they are the same pigment. Uh, and you can see this by just tracking the line as it crosses this boundary. What's happening here is the combination of lateral inhibition, namely the yellow detectors over here inhibit the yellow detectors in that spot. The purple detectors or sets of purple detectors in this surround inhibit the purple detectors within the stripe. Because the outputs of the uh, detectors uh, everywhere give you a perceived quality that depends on the relative activation or inhibition. If you have unyellow, that's perceived as purple. If you have unpurple, that's perceived as yellow. And the lateral inhibition combined with the opponent process circuitry gives you a change in the subjective quality of the color affected by the lateral inhibition from the surround. Let me give you a couple of other examples. This one uh, I snagged off Twitter just last night. This is pretty amazing, but these spheres here are all the same color. At least the uh, part that is not obscured by stripes is. They are all a kind of coppery beige. You can uh, freeze the frame, do a screen grab, and convince yourselves if you are skeptical. All of that color comes from simultaneous color contrast, a product of lateral inhibition and opponent process circuitry. This is my favorite. This bowl of strawberries contains no red pixels. All of the redness that you see here comes from uh, grayish patches which are perceived as red by lateral inhibition from this cyan or turquoisey wash. I could barely believe it myself, so I grabbed this, I put it into Photoshop, I uh, 
I used the eyedropper tool to find out what color this part of the strawberry really was. That's it. That is actually a grab from the eyedropper tool from Photoshop. It is gray, but in the context of this overall cyan wash, it is perceived as a pretty a reasonably vivid red. Okay, third property of neural circuitry that will explain some of our consciousness. Again, very common in all of our sensory systems in virtually all organisms. This is called habituation. Namely, neurons that fire a lot over a long period of time tend to slow down their firing rate. You can think of it as getting tired, they're not literally fatigued, but they bring their, when they're constantly stimulated, they bring their rate back down to baseline. It's another example of how the, uh, your nervous system really gets bored with things that are the same, but is very attentive to things that change. An example that you've all experienced is habituation to temperature. So you go into a nice cold lake on a hot day and when you put your toes in, uh, it can feel like really icy cold and it can deter you from going in further. But as you stand, your feet, as we say, get used to it. That is habituation of neural firing. So it starts to feel kind of like the same temperature as your skin. Then you go in a little bit deeper, the water comes up over your ankles. Now your ankles feel like they're immersed in cold water, even as your feet feel that they're in a tepid water. And that continues as you go deeper and deeper and successive patches of skin get exposed for the first time to the cold, they register the cold, then they habituate, doesn't feel so cold anymore. Again, I'm going to ask you now to take a mental leap and to combine two different concepts that I have explained. So now I want you to combine opponent process circuitry, the topic of the previous discussion, with habituation. Okay, well, I hope your minds can handle that combination. And here's the way these demonstrations work. You show people a stimulus A for a long period of time, long enough so that the A cells habituate. In an opponent process circuit, what this means is that the uh, B cells, that is the inputs from the opposing quality, which inhibit the same cell that the A's excite. Now with a neutral stimulus, equal amounts of A and B, because the A has been habituated, even though the inputs have equal amounts of A and B, the B predominates because the B inputs have not been habituated, and so you will perceive the neutral stimulus as B because of the habituation of one of the two qualities. Let me illustrate with uh, a uh, crude visual analogy. Imagine you've got receptors for hot in your skin, you've got receptors for cold, they are wired together in an opponent process circuit, which I have symbolized by this tug of war. Uh, imagine that there is a pointer uh, attached to the rope and that your subjective experience depends on where the pointer points laterally. So if it points in the middle, that corresponds to something feeling tepid. If it drifts in this direction, something feels warm. If it drifts in that direction, then something feels cool. Now imagine that you uh, only have the hot receptors working. They are struggling, let's say, against a one-ton weight. So they are pulling and pulling and pulling, and they're just getting more and more and more uh, tired without getting anywhere. Now we remove it. We have equal amounts of cold and hot, but the hot receptors, these guys, have gotten tired out. And so the entire uh, line gets uh, pulled over to the left and the resulting uh, input will feel cool even though objectively it consists of equal amounts of hot and uh, cold uh, input. That is a uh, tepid input now will feel cold. Temperature after effects can be demonstrated with a simple experiment you could try at home. <clears throat> Over here I have a cup of steaming hot water. Over here <clears throat> I have a cup of cold water, put some more ice cubes in. Over here I have some tepid water right out of the tap, halfway in between hot and cold. Put one hand in the hot water, ow, one hand in the cold water, keep it there for a few seconds. Now I take them out, put them both in the tepid water. Now this finger 
experiences the water as cold, this finger experiences the water as hot. This demonstration has been known for centuries. It blew the minds of the uh, medieval philosophers who first discovered it, because as we will see in the lecture on perception, it tells us that we can't trust our senses and we have to doubt the very basis of knowledge. Uh, so temperature after effects, try it at home if you want. Color after effects. Now remember that the red and green cones converge on a ganglion cells whose relative activity level influences whether we see qualitatively red or green. Same with yellow and blue. It'll also explain motion after effects. This is from your textbook. Uh, you can, I'm not going to uh, keep it on the screen long enough for you to experience it for yourself, but you can freeze the uh, video and try it stare dead center at the middle of the flag for 30 seconds to a minute, then hop your eyes over to the white spot. You should see a Union Jack in vivid red, white, and blue. This one I like better. So I'm going to, and it can be demonstrated in a shorter amount of time. The trick is simply to look at the dot in the center of the black and white photograph. You should see a vivid color photograph, which is not there. This is a black and white photograph. All of the color has been supplied as after effects from staring at the display. Again, you've got to keep your eye centered on the black spot for it to work. Indeed, when it, uh, when the color after effect manifests itself, superimposed on the black and white photograph, it can be destroyed if you move your eyes around so that the colors are not superimposed on the uh, appropriate lightnesses. This is another example that I like, which doesn't take much time to demonstrate. Stare at the cross in the center. You should see a rotating green spot, which is in fact a rotating nothing. The only thing that corresponds to that green spot is the absence of magenta. The green color is a product of habituation and opponent process circuitry. Now I mentioned uh, that it, uh, I'll give you uh, another example. Again, I'm not going to pause the video f for this, which uh, also came through uh, social media a couple of days ago, but you're welcome to freeze the video and try it on yourself. I mentioned that opponent process circuitry and habituation are ubiquitous features of the nervous system. They apply to temperature, they apply to color, they also apply to patterns of motion. I'm going to show you a spiral display. I would like you to keep your eyes fixated at the center of the spiral, doing your best not to dart around the screen. Now, as long as you keep your eyes fixated, it doesn't matter what thoughts you think. This effect, like the other perceptual effects, occurs at a level of the nervous system that proceeds without requiring conscious attention, without any particular thought process. You can think any thoughts you want. You can hum to yourself the uh, theme music from The Twilight Zone, uh, which opened with a display very much like this. Da -da 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 Keep looking. Try not to move your eyes. Now I'm going to, uh, in a few seconds, I'm going to uh, replace this display and reappear on the screen. What I would like you to do when I reappear is just look at my nose. Okay? When this vanishes and when I reappear, are you ready? Five, four, three, two, one. Now you should have experienced the great exploding head illusion. Always a great sensation in Introduction to Psychological Science. Uh, I, I try to avoid getting a swelled head, but at moments like this it is uh, impossible. I actually experienced a version of the uh, great exploding head illusion in reverse in a natural environment. In this case uh, it was the great receding cliff face illusion, 
I was mountain biking in California, got to the edge of a canyon, and looked across and saw that the opposite face of the canyon seemed to be moving backwards. And it moved back and back and back, although of course it wasn't going anywhere. This was not an earthquake. Uh, and at first I thought, what, what is going on? Am I having a LSD flashback from the 60s? And then I realized I didn't take LSD in the 60s. I was a child in the 60s, so it couldn't be that. Then it hit me. I had spent the previous half an hour mountain biking on a fairly narrow trail in which the foliage had been expanding from the center of view because of perspective. Then when I reached a uh, neutral stimulus that was neither expanding nor contracting, my uh, outward flowing motion detectors had been habituated with a neutral stimulus, now the inward flowing motion detectors predominated the output. Inward optical flow is the same as something receding from the line of sight, and so the opposite face of the canyon seemed to be moving backwards indefinitely. Now, I promised that I would perform a miracle. That was not the miracle. Now I'm going to perform the miracle. Here it is, and you should be able to explain how it occurs. I got it from the Weekly World News. Look at this image for one minute and a miracle will happen. I'm not going to uh, wait the minute during this video. You can freeze the frame and do it for yourself. And in the discussion sections, I'm going to call on you to explain how the miracle occurred. So to sum up, I have tried to explain to you how neural firing works, how synaptic transmission works, what feature detectors are, the first uh, registration of pattern in the nervous system, the first demonstration of anything we'd be willing to call meaningful or intelligent, the contrast between local and distributed representations, what computation in neural networks consists of, what learning in neural networks might consist of, and then properties of real neural networks with large psychological effects, namely lateral inhibition, opponent process circuitry, habituation.